Um, so I'm Henry, and I'm currently doing my PhD study in Georgia Tech. I'm going to talk about my research work on learning to represent a graph using deep neural network approach. So um, graphs are very commonly used as a data structure, and uh, they have many applications. For example, um, given a molecule structure, we are interested in predicting its uh, property value, and it can be used for drug discovery. And uh, in the recommendation system, where you have a user item bipartite interaction graph, we are interested in predicting a pair of user and items. And uh, also for knowledge graph, if you want to do some reasoning or uh, question answering with the help of knowledge graph, uh, typically you need to learn the representation of the graph. And uh, finally, there are many um, MP-complete problems which are on graphs, such as the vertex cover, uh, max cut, or uh, traveling salesman problem. Um, this is the outline of today's talk, and uh, before going to my approach, I'd like to give a brief review of uh, the existing approaches. Um, first, about the predicting molecule or RNA sequence uh, property. Um, so given a RNA sequence, uh, if you are interested in predicting its binding affinity, which can be simply treated as a binary classification problem, um, one approach is to build a dictionary of uh, features where each feature represents a substring of your uh, existing sequences. And uh, you can convert the uh, RNA sequence into a back of words feature representation. And it is similar for the graph, but the graph is more challenging since you need to deal with the different size of the, the graph and uh, you also have the alignment, alignment problem. And uh, one application is to predict his power conversion efficiency, which can be characterized as a regression problem. And uh, similarly, you can build such kind of dictionary where each keyword in the dictionary is a, a subgraph or the graphlet of your molecule graphs. Uh, this approach typically needs to uh, have two stages, where in the first stage, you need to build a kernel matrix, where uh, you need to characterize the pairwise similarity between your instances, or you can simply use, uh, like I previously mentioned, the uh, backwards features. But typically, this kind of uh, approach are not that scalable for um, millions of data. And uh, in the second stage, you will build a, say, SVM on top of your feature, but the problem is your constructive feature is not aware of your downstream task, which means those features may not be discriminative enough and the second example is uh, for the temporal recommendation, where your user item interaction contains the time information. Uh, in other words, we are interested in predicting who will do what and when. So uh, typically, uh, commonly used matrix factorization may not be a good choice because it simply ignores the time information. And uh, although you can simply divide your timeline into epochs and uh, do the matrix factorization within each epoch to characterize the changing feature of the user item, but the, then the problem is how you can divide the timeline. And uh, the final example is uh, on the graph combinatorial optimization. So for example, in the social network, if you are an um, advertiser and you want to advertise your product such that um, uh, more and more user will be exposed to the advertisement. So um, this can be simplified as a kind of um, a minimum vertex cover problem, where you want to pick as few nodes as possible, but at the same time you want to cover the entire graph, entire uh, edges in the graph. And it is known to be an MP-complete problem, but um, there are some um, approximation methods for that. For example, you can sequentially pick those unpicked edge and uh, add them to your cover set. But uh, these kind of rules are manually defined and uh, typically they don't take the graph structure into consideration. Then the question is whether we can learn something better. Okay, um, so next I'm going to introduce our approach. And instead of uh, uh, doing a mathematical way, I'd like to give it a more intuitive explanation. 
So take the image as an example. So you are you know, already familiar with the convolution on the image where you apply the filter on each local patch, uh, which means you define a such a neighborhood and uh, you apply the same operator on each neighborhood. And uh, we can make analogies to the graph case where you do the filter on each one hop neighborhood. Uh, for example, if you have such kind of a uh, um, Monica graph and uh, we associate the uh, vector, uh, vectorial representation for each node where each vector can be treated as uh, like uh, channels in the image case. Like each pixel, each pixel have um, multiple channels and uh, here each node in the graph have um, uh, different dimensions of the representation. And, uh, you can uh, gather the information from the neighborhood uh, node to update the embedding of each, the, the, its own node. And then, okay, now it's time to put it together. Um, so given a Monica graph, um, we associate each, uh, each node with an embedding vector. And uh, we, in order to update the uh, embedding of the node two, we gather the information from the neighborhood embedding and also the neighborhood of features. For example, the, in Monica case, the feature can be the atomic number of those uh, items in the neighborhood. And uh, we do this for all the nodes at the same time. And uh, typically, this process can be iterated through multiple steps. For example, if we iterate it through T steps, then um, you can imagine each node will capture a longer range of um, information within T hops. And finally, we aggregate them together through some extension mechanism or weighted combination to get the uh, vector representation for graph. And uh, this can be trained end-to-end uh, -end with the supervision. For example, the, the energy of that molecule can be a supervision and uh, the entire framework is trained end-to-end. -end. Um, we did some experiment on the RNA sequences and molecules. For example, the this is uh, one type of regression problem and uh, comparing to the second best baseline, um, uh, which is uh, either string kernel or the simple deep, uh, deep neural network or deep convolution uh, network, we uh, gain much better performance regarding the regression loss. And uh, for the Monica case, um, this is one application used for screening the organic uh, solar Panel materials, and uh, the data is taken from the famous Harvard Kinetic Energy Project, which contains 2.3 million molecules. And uh, uh, yeah, again, we can get a much better regression loss. And also, there's a trade-off between your model size versus the uh, your performance. So in this figure, the horizontal axis represents your model size, uh, which equals to the number of parameters. And the vertical uh, axis represents your mean absolute error, and uh, the lower the better. And uh, our approach is here. And uh, if you simply use uh, some graph kernel, you will get something here, which uh, with a very large model. And if you apply some hashing to get reduce the model size, you will suffer from the the poor performance. So in other words, the embedding methods can get a much compact model and uh, at the same time, improves the performance. And uh, also, this kind of approach can get some interpretable results. For example, for the RNA case, we can draw some um, so-called sequence logo, which um, captures some position-specific information that you learn from the data. And for the Monica case, we can also use the attention mechanism to um, highlight those uh, very important uh, fragments in the molecule. For example, the we learned that such kind of uh, fragments are very predictive for the higher efficiency value. And uh, we have extended this approach to the network analysis and the recommendation system. Um, here is an example. Suppose you have a social network where um, you know some are good guys and some are bad guys, but uh, you only have a partially labeled data, and you want to infer the labels for the rest of the user. Um, the modification is simple. You just modify the loss function to each of the nodes in the 
in the graph instead of a, a single uh, objective function or for the entire graph. And uh, we apply this approach to some um, document classification in um, citation network where we outperform some uh, unsupervised uh, embedding methods like uh, the NoteVec or DeepWork. There are also some benchmark data sets on the um, social network and the Wikipedia data set. Um, we gain a, a lot regarding the, the F1 score here. Yeah. Okay, uh, then come to the recommendation problem. So what we do is to unroll the user item interaction through time. So here um, we get such kind of uh, dependency graph where the user and the item feature will evolve after each event happened to them. So uh, if you unroll through the time, you'll get such kind of a dependency graph and uh, uh, you can abstract it as a kind of a directed graph and uh, apply the same trick we used before. But the problem is here is uh, you only have one gigantic graph and uh, to make the training easier, we apply some stochastic method and also use the truncated backpropagation through time, which is also a, a standard trick in uh, training the recurrent neural network. And uh, here are some experiments. We did uh, some experiment on the um, uh, TV program recommendation, our restaurant recommendation on YERF data set, and uh, regarding the um, accuracy of the item prediction and also the return time prediction for user, we can, we can uh, much better performance over the baselines. And we find it is uh, especially suitable for those uh, uh, recurring event recommendation. For example, you visit the same restaurant multiple times or you uh, watch uh, the same TV program multiple times. Okay, the finally I'd like to talk our recent work on the graph combinatorial optimization. I still take the uh, minimal vertex cover as an example. So, uh, oh, the, the, there may be some problem with the display, but uh, I want to say there are typically two different type of methods. One is based on the uh, branch and bound. It's a, it's a method which can guarantee to find uh, the uh, optimal solution, but typically the the time cost is exponential to the size of the problem. And uh, another method is the uh, uh, heuristic or greedy method where you can have some approximation guarantee, but uh, typically the performance is poor. But I think the most uh, uh, severe problem of these two existing approaches is that they cannot learn from the uh, solved instance to gain experiments to, for the future tasks. So. In real world data, typically the graphs are sampled from some um, common distribution. For example, a social network, uh, one can characterize use the Barabasi Airbus model, which is a kind of a scale free network, and uh, the degree distribution of the degree follows some um, long tail observation. Like, And also for the road network, uh, typically you have a fixed graph. And the only thing changing is the weight on the graph. For example, if it is a traffic network um, for the Atlanta, and uh, typically the traffic is uh, very severe in the morning, and uh, it gets worse, even worse in the afternoon. And, but this kind of a, uh, changing is on the same graph. So um, a direct method may be to use uh, supervised learning. But the problem is it's very hard to get the supervision because uh, solving such kind of uh, combinatorial optimization on large scale is uh, already hard for the. And so we propose to use the reinforcement learning to solve this problem. And uh, the principle is learn by trial and error. So uh, here's a little bit of background about reinforcement learning. So suppose you are teaching an agent to play the uh, brick breaker game and uh, the reward at each time step is the score you can earn, you can earn at this time point and uh, the state 
simply represents your screen. Um, your action, uh, you, can, you can only move your board to the left or to the right. You have two choices. And uh, there is a concept called uh, action value function, which characterizes your expected future reward. And uh, finally, the policy, which indicates how you will behave at each time point. So um, suppose if you have a very perfect uh, value, action value function, then you can simply use a greedy policy, which means at each time point, I only pick the action which can maximize my future total expected reward. Uh, similar on graph case, um, for example, the vertex cover, our objective is to minimize the number of nodes we picked. So the reward is simply a constant, which is a negative one. This means uh, each time you made an action, you will get a constant penalty one, or, or reward a negative one. And uh, the state is uh, simply the currently um, partially solved uh, solution, which contains the node you already picked and uh, the node you haven't picked yet. And uh, the action value function is on the rest of the node. And uh, we simply use a greedy policy because uh, we assume we have uh, learned such kind of uh, perfect action value function, uh, which means each time we only pick the best node. And uh, yeah, the difficulty is how to parameterize your action value function. And um, the answer is to use our graph embedding framework. Like uh, here, we take a uh, partially solved graph as the input, and uh, the output is the, the predicted score on each node, which equals to the action value function. And we use some standard uh, framework uh, called uh, deep Q learning, which fits this kind of equation. I, I want to elaborate it more because it's more of a standard trick. OK, so here are some experiment results. First, we sample some uh, scare-free networks. And, uh, and uh, on this bar plot, our performance is barely visible because we can get almost a uh, perfect approximation ratio. As, uh, the ratio equal to 1 means uh, it's uh, perfect. And uh, typically, the ratio is larger than or equal to 1. The, the lower, the better. <coughs> And also, this approach can not only um, generalize to the graphs from the same distribution, but it can also generalize to larger instances. For example, we train our model on a small graph, which contains only 50 to 100 nodes. And uh, we can generalize to up to thousands of nodes. Oh, and uh, of course, the larger the instance, the harder the problem. But we can still keep the ratio low below 1.007, which is almost perfect. And uh, also, there are some trade-offs between the time and uh, your solution. Typically, for the um, brute force search or heuristic search, uh, the more time you give it, and the, the better performance you have. And uh, for example, for the CPLEX, which is a, a commonly used toolkit, um, at the beginning, they can get a very poor result, but in a short time. And uh, later on, with more iteration, they can get a better performance. And here are some performance plots for the approximation uh, methods, which are fast but uh, with poor performance. And uh, this is our approach. We uh, like uh, within the within 0.1 second, we can get the the best performance, almost comparable to the CPLEX with uh, more than 100 seconds. And uh, we can also apply it to real-world data. For example, this is uh, data taken from the Stanford website. It's a mem tracker graph. And uh, we sample some uh, uh, subgraphs, learn from them, and uh, generalize to the, the entire network. And uh, our solution is only, uh, we will only pay one more node for comparing to the best uh, optimal solution. And uh, here is an example. I'm not sure how to play this video, but uh, so here I just want to say we actually learned a heuristic which is not uh, discovered before. 
um, the comparing to uh, the heuristic, like uh, you always pick the node with largest degree, we can pick the nodes while maintaining the connectivity of the graph structure. This is an, a heuristic that I haven't discovered before. Yeah, and uh, also we can generalize to other combinatorial optimization problems, for example, the max cut, where you want to divide the nodes into two separate components and uh, maximize the edges between the two components. Or uh, the classical traveling sales plan problem, and uh, also more general, the set cover. Uh, yeah, finally, I'd like to take this chance to, to say thanks to my collaborators and my advisor. Okay, um, thanks for listening.